once again, we are back in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. And if you ask, how long will it take to finish Ephesians? I do not know. So it's, uh, it takes as long as it takes, I guess, is the easy answer. Ephesians chapter 2, but you know, we are up to chapter 2 already, so that's pretty good. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 11 to verse 18 this afternoon. Verse 11 to 18, then we'll stop and kind of make a quick review from last week and continue on. Ephesians 2 verse 11, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, speaking of Jesus Christ, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all. I'm in the wrong chapter. Why? Somebody should have stopped me there. I'm reading going like this doesn't sound like the right verses. I'm just reading along. Let me start again. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, so that there's no confusion. Wherefore, remember, that should be the right words, right? There we go. Yeah, I was just marching along there until I got, I had to switch over towards the top of the next column, and I saw chapter 2 written there, and I thought, wait, but I'm in chapter 2. How could it be chapter 2? It was still it's still good words, right? There you go. Uh, all right. This time, I think I'm in the right chapter. As I did that a couple of weeks ago or, and in the Bulgarian service. I was in a completely different book and uh, didn't catch it. That uh, I think I was supposed to be reading from Luke, and I was in Mark, and this doesn't seem right to me. They told you where to wait. Uh, yes, I heard quickly. Yes, I was in the wrong place. Ephesians 2, verse 11, this time, wherefore remember, that sounds better, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he, Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So there you go, this time Ephesians chapter 2. So last week we were looking at verses 11 and 12. And talking about that hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And kind of we've seen this uh, idea a couple of times already in Ephesians, where Paul, before he makes kind of a new point, makes reference sort of back to what we were before Jesus Christ. You saw that at the beginning of chapter two, where he says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So he makes reference back to who we are and kind of we've been by extension making application there that if we were once in that state, well, so is the rest of the world who are, if they're not in Christ, they also are still in that state. You know, we, if we are in Christ, it's talking about past tense. We, in the past, we were dead in trespasses and sins, but now we've been made alive in Christ and you see that again in verse 11, where he says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past 
Gentiles in the, in the flesh, right? So in time past, that's who we were. So he makes this reference back to that and then again reminds us of the hope and security that we have in Jesus Christ, as you see in verse 12, that ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, right? So we were separated. It doesn't mean like we were aliens from some other planet, right? It's not what he's talking about. Being like a foreigner in another country, that you, you were separated. You weren't a citizen. You weren't a part of that group. You were an alien. So you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and notice how he says, and strangers from the covenants of promise. But then the next couple of words are pretty strong. And that's sort of where we were ending our time last week. Because he says, not only were you, you know, aliens, not only were you strangers, but notice what he says, having no hope and without God in the world. And as I said, we kind of ended there last time we were talking about that. Because as Paul makes that statement, no hope and without God, that is the state of many people in the world and even many religious people. And that was where we were kind of ending up last week that even people who are very religious may actually be godless. You say, well, how could that be? I mean, they, they think about God. They claim to know God. They, they or at least seem to have a desire to want to know God. But we can be very religious <laughs> and not know God. And one of the verses we looked at last week, and we're not going to turn there for time's sake today, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is speaking there, and Matthew chapter 7 is part of probably the, the longest sermon in the Bible. I'm pretty sure that's the case, because it starts in Matthew chapter 5. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew chapter 5, <coughs> chapter 6, and chapter 7 are all one sermon that Jesus is preaching on the Mount. That's the clever name, Sermon on the Mount. And in the midst of that sermon, as he's kind of bringing it to an end, in Matthew chapter 7, I think it starts at verse 23, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it's verse 20, where it starts, where Jesus says that in that day, many will say to me, Lord, in your name, didn't we cast out demons? In your name, didn't we do these wonderful works? And, you know, they're, they're basically standing before Jesus saying, you know, we've done all of this in your name. And Jesus says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. They were very religious people, right? And we would say, well, yeah, they were religious. I mean, they knew God. They're doing things in God's name. They're claiming it. They're saying, Lord, we've done all of these good works for you. And Jesus' response is not only that I didn't know you, but he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, meaning even what they thought of as good works. Jesus said that. That's just filth. That's just wicked. It's iniquity. That word iniquity, not common necessarily in our everyday speech in, in English today. But it's that idea of something that is sinful, that is another big word, again, we don't necessarily use too often, but transgression, which means to step over, right? So I, there is a rule, there's a law, there's a, you know, some boundary. And if I transgress, I've, that idea of trans, like we think of transport and transversal, and that this word trans has the idea of going over or across something. Right? We talk about transiting the ocean, meaning I'm going from one side to the other and crossing over. So if you just even think about that when you hear the word transgression, it's this idea of stepping over, that there's a standard, there's some set, and I go over it. And this idea of iniquity is that, that it's actually a transgression. I've stepped over, I've done something that was not pleasing to God, or I violated his law. And that's what's very interesting to me in Matthew chapter 7 for Jesus 
to say of these people who thought they were doing good in his name, which in my mind then would be a religious person, right? I mean, if you're not religious, you're not going to be doing works in the name of Jesus. Right? That's you To even talk about him, you have to have some level of religion or, you know, I don't know another way to put that religious desire maybe to say, I... I want to do something for Jesus. You're thinking of him. You have some knowledge of him. But Jesus said, depart from me because I, he didn't know them. And that's what's interesting here when we compare that with what Paul says, that they were without hope, right? They're having no hope and they're without God in the world. They may be very religious, but they're without God. And so then as Paul continues, and we'll continue with the passage there then in Ephesians 2, verse 13, again, he reminds us of who we were, but he says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye, so this group of people he's writing to, ye who sometimes, so talking about in the past, sometimes were far off. What does he mean by that? Well, again, it's that same idea, having no hope being without God, being separated from God, be, being far from his truth and his promises. Uh, you know, sometimes we talk about a relationship that's been severed or something like that. And we say that, you know, we're estranged from one another. And sometimes you see that even within a family, a brother and a sister who just don't communicate anymore. We say they're estranged. They're far off from one another. Right? They're not just going to pick up the phone and communicate and everything's going to be okay. Right? It, it might sometimes even get to the place where you know, the brother or the sister sees the other one calling and doesn't answer, doesn't want to talk to them, doesn't want to communicate right there. That's the idea of far off. This is there is no communication. There is a separation. You know, forget my number. I don't want to speak to you. That's the idea. And so Paul is saying, now in Christ Jesus, he who sometimes were far off, you've been made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. Right? That's, you know, the world over is looking for peace. The world over speaks about peace. Here, Paul's talking about peace with God. Because as we begin to read God's word, as you begin to study the Bible, you understand very quickly that on our own, we do not have peace with God. And I think as a general rule, that is why people begin to search for hope in all kinds of other things. You know, and I, it's easy for us to say, well, yeah, in drugs and alcohol, but in all kinds of things. It's not just drugs and alcohol. Some people try to find their peace even just in work, right? And they, they work so much that they sometimes lose their family. But they're just, what, they're, they're looking for peace. They, they're, there's something missing in life. And how many people talk about that? There's just something missing. I, I can't figure out what it is, but I know there's something lacking. Well, it's that peace because we have a conscience given to us by God that speaks to us and tells us, one, that there is a God. Nature itself speaks about God, shows God. Uh, it's something Neil and I have been talking about as he's been here uh, because Neil, like me, enjoys science and those kinds of things. And so he was talking about even before he knew Christ, didn't necessarily believe in evolution, but of course that was what was being pushed and taught and all of that. But it just, it doesn't line up. It didn't make sense because nature declares the majesty of God. Nature declares God's glory. And uh, so he and I, one day we were out, I was talking about uh, some of uh, the animals in nature. When you look at it and you say, that had to have been created. It couldn't have happened just by accident. And uh, I think I was kind of making reference to how tall he was and that I didn't want his head to explode when he bent over from all the pressure that would be there. And it made me think about a giraffe because giraffes have a very long neck, you know. And uh, what's very interesting that giraffes have a, 
I would describe it as a valve. I'm sure there's some biological term for what that is, but they were designed with this so that when they dip their head down to drink water, as you think about how high up their head is and how hard their heart has to work to put blood all the way up there, if you know much about pressure and vacuums and trying to move water up to that kind of height, it takes an enormous amount of pressure. Now imagine when that giraffe dips its head down to drink water. It, it takes no pressure to push water downhill, a lot of pressure to go up. If it wasn't for this valve in their body, their heads would literally explode when they drank water. I know you're like, that sounds gross. I don't want to imagine a giraffe with an exploding head. But see, giraffes don't explode. You know, praise the Lord, right? At least as far as I know, it's not a common occurrence. And as we were talking about that, I said, you know, so how many giraffes had an exploded head before giraffes decided to evolve this valve? Right? It just... And, and there's other things like that. There's a, and there's actually a documentary series called, uh, An I think it's Animals That Defy Evolution. And they're all creatures that have things like that where it couldn't have come by small changes because everything had to be in place at once. Uh, one of the coolest, if, uh, if you're into cool animals, is the bombardier beetle. And they actually have two chambers of chemicals in their body and in order to get away from an enemy, if something's coming to eat them or whatever, they release these two chemicals, which explode when they come together. So basically they have an explosive compound within their abdomen. And the, the chemicals are separated, which is very important because as soon as they come together, it's an exothermic reaction, extreme exothermic reaction, basically an explosion. And it's cool when you see video of this. It's just like they're shooting explosives as they try to run away. The same question, how many of them exploded <laughs> before they decided I need to keep these chemicals separate inside my body? It, it, it had to happen all at once. It had to be created that way, it was designed. And that's the thing, nature declares the majesty of God. We know there's a God. And when we talk about this, people searching for that thing, that, that missing piece. You know, why, why is it that people do uh, tend to gravitate towards an idea of religion? of Because of it's a search for God. We know he's there. And we know that we need to have a relationship with him. And somewhere inside of us, we understand that we, we don't have that relationship and that there's something that has to be made right in order for us to have that. But all of that knowledge is really within us. And that's what Paul's talking about. They're without God. They're without hope. And they don't have this peace. But because of Christ, you know, we were once far off and we didn't have, we were sort of in a sense at war with God. We didn't have any peace within ourselves. And now Christ has come and through faith in him, we can be cleansed and washed. And now he is our peace. I no longer have to fear God in the judgment and wonder if I've been good enough or if I've been righteous enough because the truth is I can't be good enough. I can't be righteous enough. That's what the earlier part of Ephesians 2 talks about. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I was, again, talking with Neil about this this morning and uh, was reading in the book of Hebrews this week about the sacrifices that Israel would make. You know, when you look at the law of the Old Testament and they would bring all of these sacrifices and the writer of Hebrews points out that if we could be righteous through the law, right? If those sacrifices could do something, then they would have just done the sacrifice once. But that wasn't the case. They had to bring that sacrifice year after year. And there's other ones that are kind of weekly. And all, you, know, you read through and you see how many offerings and sacrifices they made. But 
If you even speak about this atonement, that was once a year, the day of atonement, and the priest would first make an offering for his own sins, and then he'd make an offering for the sins of the people. And they did that year after year after year. And the writer of Hebrews points out that those sacrifices never made someone righteous. The only thing they did is reminded them that they were not righteous. Right? Because it was bringing that lamb and, you know, it's a gruesome thing if you really think about all the process. And you know, I'm not going to go through the details so much, but you read about that in the Old Testament. You yourself had to kill that lamb and give it to the priest. Because it was a reminder of what the penalty of sin was. This baby lamb that you've been caring for and protecting, and now you bring and you take its life because of your sin, right? It died because of you. And that was a yearly reminder. And Christ was that lamb who died once for all. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is pointing out. The law couldn't save us. We couldn't be made righteous by that. All it did is showed us that we were not righteous. But Christ, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world, was offered once for all. And that debt is now paid. And so in him, we who are sometimes far off, now we're made nigh, right, close to, by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he is our peace who hath made both one, right? There was a separation. And he, he extends that illustration there. Hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, right? You think about next door is a restaurant. There is a wall of partition between us and the restaurant, right? I, I can't get over there. They can't get over here. It, it has separated us. But Christ, right, there was a wall that separated us from God. And that was pictured even in the tabernacle in the temple where you had this outer court where the people could come in. Then you had what was called the holy place. And that was where only the priest could go. And then the most holy place. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the, they had the tablets of the Ten Commandments, where all that, and only the high priest could go in and him only once a year and he had to be bringing that blood of that lamb that was sacrificed for the sins. He would go in and, and he was the only one authorized to go in. That's why Jesus Christ is our high priest. And he went in with blood of the lamb that was sacrificed for the sins. And he covered over the law. If you think about the picture of the law being inside that Ark of the Covenant. So the blood covered the law which was against us, which we see later here in this passage. So the priest goes in, makes that sacrifice, but there was a curtain that separated. So no one could go into that most holy place. It was a wall of partition between us and God. We were far from him. As a matter of fact, if we had been, you know, uh, Hebrews, we could only come into that outer court with a sacrifice. And even there, we didn't necessarily stay. We certainly weren't getting into the holy place and definitely not the most holy place. There was a lot of separation there. But because of Jesus Christ, and when Christ was crucified, actually, that curtain that was in the temple, the Bible records that it split in two. It and the Bible says, thus signifying that the way was now open. We were once far off, but now we've been made nigh. Now we're close. And Christ tore down that wall of partition. And how did he do it? Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. No, oh, that's not, again, a, a common word. But in a sense, it has a relation to the word enemy. If there's enmity between people, it means that there is an issue. There is some, could be some anger between them, but there is something that is dividing them 
because of a wrong that was done. You know, I, if I did something that hurt you, you may have enmity against me because of my action that caused hurt to you. That, that enmity causes a separation and a break in the relationship. Right? There, there's no friendship there. The friendship has now been hurt. You know, sometimes we use the phrase, I burned the bridge, meaning there, now there is no connection and I can't get back over there. The bridge is burned. There is enmity between us. Well, the Bible talks about our sins setting up enmity or causing enmity between us and God because God is righteous and holy. And so our sins separate us from him. There is this enmity between us and God. And here, Paul even explains what that enmity is. It's vrajda in, in Bulgarian, actually, the word they use for enmity. He says, it's the law of, contain, of commandments <laughs> contained in ordinances. So that, that phrase there. The law of commandments contained in ordinances. What, what's he talking about there? Well, that, that's the Old Testament law, right? That's the law of commandments contained in ordinances, right? Because there were all of these ordinances, things that they had to do. That's what an ordinance is. You are, in a sense, ordered to do this thing. It's an ordinance. You are required to do it. What were those ordinances? They had feast days, right? They had holy days. They had sacrifices. They're, you know, you have to sow your crop at this time. You have to do this at this time. Uh, actually saw, kind of made me think of the booths that they had to build. They would have to build these booths that to live in for a certain period of time during, I think it was Feast of Tabernacles is when you made the booths. And uh, you would, you know, making this out of like branches and things like that. Uh, we were up in Vitusha Mountain yesterday and walking on one of the uh, kind of paths there. I looked over and somebody had made with uh, like pine branches a little, I'm sure it was a child, kind of a little tent almost out of these pine branches. And I was like, oh, somebody made a booth, was I was thinking to myself uh, as I saw it. But those were ordinances that if they didn't keep, you could actually be like kicked out of the tribe, you're, you're not following the ordinances. These are required. That's the law of commandments contained in those ordinances. But notice what Paul said. He said, that's actually the enmity that was against us. In other words, the, that law and those ordinances were our judge. They showed that we were separated from God. We we're talking recently with someone who mentioned this, that they had started to read the Bible and they had started with, uh, I think it was Matthew or whatever. They started in the New Testament. And to a certain extent, kind of liked what they read, you know, it's like, this is nice, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall inherit the earth, you know, those it all sounds nice. So they decided, well, I kind of want to read some of the Old Testament. They started to read the Old Testament. And, uh, and they were talking about it. They said, and, and as I was reading the Old Testament, I, it made me sound like a very bad person. That, as I read this, I thought, I'm, I'm actually very wicked. And I didn't like it so much. I thought, I need to go back and read the New Testament again. I liked what it said there. But they said, unfortunately, now I started reading there and I was thinking about and it was reminding me of the things in the Old Testament of I'm not a good person. So that, that law, that commandment, those ordinances, they're against us, right? They're, they're enmity against us. They show us that we are separated from God. Paul refers to the law, I think it's in Romans chapter 7, as a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Right? When you think about a, a schoolmaster, right, teacher there, uh, 
Does a teacher always tell you, yes, that's perfect. That's 100% right. You are so good. Not a good teacher, right? See, a good teacher says, no, that's not correct. Right? Sometimes as students, we hated tests, you know, like, oh, I don't want to take a test. But really, if you think about what that test does, the things you get wrong on the test help you to know what you don't understand. They, they actually, that test really can help you to improve. It, it directs you. It guides you. And that's, that's a schoolmaster, right? A good teacher is going to point out when you did it wrong. We were talking about that this morning on our drive over. Uh, it's kind of speaking of professors that we liked as in university. And uh, is Neil a similar experience to me? Uh, it seems like the professors that we loved were the ones that not necessarily everybody loved. But like my favorite professor was one of the hardest professors. But I learned so much from him. As a matter of fact, you never wanted to answer incorrectly in class. He would throw markers or erasers and things at you. If your answer was too dumb, he would just say, that's a stupid answer. How did you come up with that? You know, and throw something at you. Uh, but he made you want to excel. right? And he showed you what you didn't know. And this is what the law does. The law comes along and it says, look, the requirement is perfection. You have fallen short. As it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, so I've often, often said, I understand that verse. I've been short most of my life. And there are a lot of things that I just can't reach. And as much as I try, as much as I might think or desire to be taller, there's nothing I can do. Jesus said that. Can a man add to his stature by taking thought? You know, if I just wish hard enough, I'll be, you know, two meters tall. Um, no, I've wished that for a long time. It's never happened. Not going to happen. You know, I'm fairly convinced. You know, I've tried stretching, no, all that. Doesn't. No, I'm not two meters tall. Never going to be two meters tall. No matter how hard I want. That idea of coming short, right? It's a mark that we cannot all have sinned and come short. Full stop. So we can't reach it. And the law makes that obvious. That's the enmity. It's against us. But Christ took that and abolished it. That is a strong word, abolished. It means completely destroyed, taken out of the way, and no longer applicable. There was, to use an illustration from the United States, you know, many have heard you know, the history and slavery in the United States. And there was a movement to end slavery called abolitionist. The idea was so that this law, this rule, would be completely destroyed and taken out of the way, and it would be no longer legal ever. And later that law was passed, and slavery was, and they used that term, slavery was abolished. It, it was no longer allowed anywhere it's completely ended. You know, I understand we could get into the politics of troubles and all that came after that. That's not the discussion. The discussion is the idea of abolish, that it was completely removed, taken out of the way, destroyed. Christ abolished with his death on the cross, the enmity, the law of commandments and the ordinances that were against us. And by doing that, he made in himself of twain, which means two, right? He took two things that were totally separate, right? There was that wall in between them, and he brought them together and made one. As it says there, one new man. 
For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And through that, then, he made peace. Because when there's enmity existing, there cannot be peace. The enmity has to be dealt with. And that's in 1 John chapter 2. And uh, another passage I was thinking of as well. But 1 John chapter 2. So further ahead in the New Testament there, kind of towards the end. Not the Gospel of John, but the first epistle of John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2. Verse number one, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate, right? That is, it's like the lawyer, the one who is advocating for us. An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I've described that word propitiation before, but just... So that everybody understands, it's the same idea, right? He abolished through his flesh, through his death on the cross, that handwriting of ordinances against us, that enmity that was there. Propitiation is a legal word. It is the thing that is paid or that satisfies the offense when someone has been offended. It satisfies the offended party. In this context, God is the offended party. Our sin offended God. And it cannot be made right until a penalty is paid. And that payment, whatever that payment is, you know, depending on the situation, is called the propitiation. The propitiator is the one who makes that payment. It could be the one who did the crime or caused the offense, and, or it could be someone else. In our case, Jesus Christ. He paid that price. And when that is given, and that's why I, I like the word, even though it's not common, it says so much in it. See, when, once that propitiation is given, the offense is taken out of the way as if it never occurred. So this other person who was grieved by our action, by our offense, is no longer able to bring it up, can no longer hold us accountable to it, can no longer, there's no condemnation that can be given because it has been propitiated. A big word. Not use, you know, you're not going to turn on American television, British television, Australian television, whatever, and probably hear the word propitiation. Even if you watched a legal show, they probably aren't going to use it. It is not a common word. But it's a very deep word. Because when you think of that, that this payment, not, ju not just that it, okay, now I'm, I'm no longer, you know, the punishment has been paid for this deal, for this thing. But the other party says, that is sufficient for me. This debt is completely canceled. The offense is completely gone. It's as if it never occurred. You are no longer under any kind of condemnation for it. You cannot be condemned for it. You, it cannot be brought up again. It is completely satisfied says all that in one word. That's why I like it. But that's what Jesus Christ did. That wall, as Paul said in Ephesians 2, that separated us. That enmity that was against us. Christ took it out of the way. And made peace. See, before that we were, as I said, sort of at war with God. Because of our sin. But now in Christ there's peace. And all that is through faith in him. Not, not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy he saved us. We can be forgiven. We can be cleansed. We can be washed clean and made 
his children through faith in what Christ did. Not because of my actions, not because I've done enough to keep the law. No, I never could. Christ did it all, and he says, believe on me. It says in John chapter 4, he said, if you would ask of me, I'd give you living water where you would never thirst again. That's really how simple salvation is. Ask. Understanding that he's the only one, he's the only source, and I just ask him. Lord, forgive me and save me. And then that enmity, those ordinances, that wall of separation, it's all broken down. And I have peace with God. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for your word today, for the truths that we find here in your your word. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and grace, Lord. Thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, it's not by works, it's not by ordinances, it's not traditions and, and all those things. Lord, it's it's Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Lord, help us to walk in that truth, Lord, and to rejoice in that truth. Lord, thank you for making salvation easy for us. Lord, it wasn't an easy thing for you. But Lord, then you freely offered it to us. Lord, and we thank you, Father, for that gift. Lord, we ask you bless now remainder of our service, our fellowship time to follow. I ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.